welcome once again to another edition of Good Books. I'm your host this week, Dr. John Cook, and with me today is Shahana Tatagupta, who has written a book called You Are Michelangelo and You Are David, Awaking the Creative and the Creation Within. Shahana writes, acts, paints, sings, and consults in design and communication strategy, primarily in Seattle. She also speaks on and coaches creativity in various parts of the U.S., working with individuals and groups ranging from four to a hundred, most recently in a national forum for education experts. Her previous books are Ten Avatars and Thrive, Falling in Love with Life. She also co-edits a monthly magazine, Courageous Creativity. Shana, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, John, for having me. This book uh, really moved me in a lot of ways. Uh, We talked about it via email. I I got so much out of this, and I I hope our, our listeners will appreciate the value of the book as we talk about it and maybe go out and get themselves a copy. Um, I've spoken ab- about this book and given you full credit for great ideas, and uh, I have friends who already have this book on Kindle, so I know it's available that oh, way, wonderful. too. <laughs> um, th- let's start with a, with a key concept that kind of pervades throughout. Uh, the book is You Are Michelangelo and You Are David, Awakening the Creative and Creation Within, and you talk mm-hmm. about Michelangelo saying that the sculptor's job is to chisel away the excess stone so that the sculpture already existing within the rock can be revealed. Yes. So that sort of applies to the whole thrust of this book, doesn't it? Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, it does. And um, one of the things I came upon in my personal spiritual life transformation, as well as I practiced what traditionally um, uh, appears to be creative gifts. You know, a lot of people associate uh, creative gifts with some form of the arts. But I started to see that uh, not only that creativity, of course, exists in everyone, but um, it, that it that it is the ability to make unique connections, and this, you, these connections we make are essentially our own DNA, our own, I, I almost our spirit DNA in how we look at the world. And these connections uh, already always exist within us. Our way of being and looking in the unique thumbprint, the value we bring. Uh, is always within us. And so if you look at our learning, education, or any sort of evolution paradigm, um, it is often based in augmentation. What else can I add? What else can I learn? What else can I go out there and seek? And we're we're often not looking right here within and not realizing that it could just be a matter of shedding. Mm -hmm. Um, Or since we also work on a magazine and do editorial work, editing, editing, the excess uh, impressions, Mm -hmm. the excess conditioning or baggage or stories or whatever else we have uh, taken on since we appeared here as pure souls. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that it, everything is already always here and all learning and discovery and skills and everything we have um, is our sort of tool set to just look within and find the light within and let it glow inside out is pervasive through the book. The other aspect of that, uh, the other subtlety of that is that it's not a one-way street. In other words, the, the, uh, what we create out of that place, that inner place of light, and, and I, I like to say divine light, um, creates us. So it's, it's, um, over some time I have observed how, um, how my, thoughts truly create my reality and then how my reality create my thoughts and so i'm i'm in charge all the way and it's a collaborative process with spirit and with everything that comes out of me and so that's what the book's cover is also um alluding to is that uh after a while you 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 cease to look at yourself as the sole creator you have become an agent in the channel for what comes through you, and then what comes through you shapes you further. Mm-hmm. And that's how true art and true creation is born. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other aspect of that image is that it has uh, both the yin and yang forces, the feminine and the masculine, and finding both within myself and finding both within um, and balancing those forces within oneself is also the the true aspect of creation. So for those who don't know about the image, it's a, it's a picture of a, 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 a man reaching out of a painting to shape a uh, clay pot, and at the top of the clay pot is an artist painting the painting that the man is reaching out of. So it, it, it sort of shows that you're the sculptor and the sculpted. 
uh, uh-huh. at the same time. You, somebody asked me when I was carrying this book around, is this a self-improvement book? And you actually say creating yourself is not an act of self-improvement, but shedding away and sculpting away the layers of what you talked about uh, to reveal your inner light. Um, but yes. you also mentioned creativity is kind of a divine uh, requirement, I guess. The creativity uh-huh. is our original blessing, our way of healing, our return home. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I think I answered the first question when I was talking earlier about yes. um, self-improvement often is associated with this idea of augmentation. Mm-hmm. Improvement means I have to do something better than I already am. Mm-hmm. And so if the entire premise is that the, the, the beauty, the goodness, the, the, the creative spirit sits within and I have to free it, I have to release it, then I... I intentionally stay away from the term improvement Mm -hmm. and rather uh, want to, I might say Mm -hmm. um, self-discovery would be, would be a better term to describe the book. Um, And as far as, um, uh, yes, certainly divine imperatives. I, um, I've seen, and when I, in my coaching work, I observe so many people who are lost only because they, they are the true wayfinders. So being lost is a great sign that you are a wayfinder mm-hmm. and you're finding your way back home. But that temporary uh, lostness that's in every hero saga, right? We, we get lost and then we come home. Um, that lostness is an inner lostness, a deviation from that original blessing of being purely who we are. And when I say who we are, I'm not talking about personality or background or culture or identity and all these uh, accrued attributes. I'm talking about that that very unique spirit sense that each person has. And when they act from there, which has often got to do with just their loving self, um, when they act from there, they are inevitably creators. Mm-hmm. Um, I also talk about, I mean, if you look at procreation, the imperative to to uh, create something like ourselves, uh, a little child, uh, it, it, the reason it's such a biological drive is because it's the more material um, plane of wanting to make something, mm-hmm. um, make love to make children. Um, but um, in, the, in, the, in the more higher spirit sense, that's what we're here to do. We're here to... I mean, I, I like to say that that's my my understanding of born in the likeness of our Creator, mm-hmm. or made in the likeness of our Creator, is that uh, we're within the creation to further create. Mm-hmm. So we're we're like little fractal, uh, uh, we're we're fractals of the larger um, power. Yeah. The larger unifying power. Yeah, and I like that notion of uh, if we're made in the image and likeness, then uh, like the Creator, we need to create. And I want to look at building the foundation a little bit because I I I'd spent a great deal of time dwelling in my own thoughts about this idea of changing your story and about the mm-hmm. creativity of a story and and how powerful a story is because it sort of creates who you are today in the world. Um, mm-hmm. where I don't even know where to begin asking questions about that. It's just, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is actually, uh, it's great that you bring that up, John, that you noticed that because it, it, when I work with people in, in workshops, um, in groups or as individuals, now I do a lot of individual, um, uh, uh, sessions of 90 minutes. It's almost always, um, everything I can, I can sense quickly everything, all the pulse points, just in the way someone tells their story. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, this idea that the past makes me who I am, mm-hmm. uh, uh, it, it, and, and a story always comes from the past. Um, and so there are many, many, many nuances to how uh, my partner Shireen and I use storytelling in a, in, in, as a device, mm-hmm. uh, because people tell stories anyway. We use it as a device to then uh, make the shift. Um, and, and what happens with storytelling? I mean, I, 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 incidentally, someone read this book and said to me, uh, oh, my goodness, what you're doing with storytelling is pretty much what is done in clinical psychology as uh, narrative therapy. Yes. And uh, when I wrote about this, all of this came spontaneously through me, so I did not actually know that. Um, 
And narrative therapy does the same thing, holds the same idea that uh, we we uh, tell our stories. That we 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 we're not able to to really look at everything that happened uh, and all the subtleties of it um, in in a holistic sense. So we pick a certain way of looking at it and, of course, telling the story. And the telling the story of it is what then entrenches it as one way of how things happened. And then how things happened, of course, makes me who I am today and that I start to act from there. And so then I'm, I'm wondering why everything seems to happen again and again in a similar way. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, that quote attributed to Einstein, anyway, um, that we can't create anything new from the consciousness that we're already in. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like we have to escape the very uh, fodder, the very foil, the very uh, matter of our stories to be able to tell a new story. But of course, we're within the story. We're we're an actor within the story. So how does one do that? Um, And so I'll bulk definitely the foundation of finding the true creator within, which is able to create newness moment to moment to moment Mm -hmm. is this fundamental idea of dying to the old story Mm -hmm. dying within dying before you die die within the body to your old story Mm -hmm. um but uh while it sounds like a huge huge concept i've had success with simply tweaking just a little something about how people um uh, tell do their everyday storytelling um, and how to focus on on a present, more present storytelling. Yes. And uh, mind you, this this has nothing to do with prevaricating or or denying sadness or denying difficulties or denying pain. Rather, it is about feeling all of that, so that the story doesn't have to be about that. Mm-hmm. And uh, most people realize that um, uh, that they have more. They have choice. They're not a victim of any circumstance they now have choice and once people start discovering choice and the joy of choice and um, one of the exercises we do for instance in workshops is to help people create a story possibility map so Mm -hmm. they look at a circumstance or a situation and they tell the story first they would as they would say it and then they have we push them to create 20 different ways of saying what what it is that they want to say about a situation and within a period of two hours, there's such a dramatic shift. The body opens up, the face opens up, the eyes light up, and and everything from everything created in that moment from there uh, has an has an has a break, a clean break, often mm-hmm. uh, from where they were when they walked in the room. That's it. So that's beautiful. You're right about it being a very big subject, not uh, you know not something I can't cover in a few minutes of right. conversation, but I hope. I did some justice. Well, you, you you did, and in fact, some of the simple exercises and reflections that you offer in the book allow people to to really, I think, glom onto the concept. Uh, I, I love the example of uh, typical conversation: Where are you from, and what do you do? Uh, uh-huh. And if you were telling a story about yourself as a reflection of your past, it'd be what happened to you. But if you instead um, uh, engage the the listener in creating something together that's more interesting and stimulating. Well, that's that's a new life, and I also appreciate very much because I did not know this about the um, the cocoon that the in which the butterfly transforms from a wormy, oozy mass of cells is to the uh, uh-huh. to the formation of those imaginal cells which make the new creature. That was a. Uh, something that I've I not only glommed onto, but I used in my presentation about your book, and even turned to a, a video parable uh, uh, called. A, oh, wonderful! Did you find something to supplement that? That's uh, great. Yes, it's called El Cid. That is that, that is one of my most favorite favorite things to mm-hmm. reflect on. I I use it in the book, of course, and I I. I it's just so incredible, isn't it? And also, there's another nuance. I don't know if I covered that in the book. I don't think I did. But when uh, scientists study it, if you poke around in that cocoon phase to look at that uh, that goop mass, then then you almost you, you basically if you poke around, you won't get any answers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you you because you disrupt that that strange process. Mm-hmm. So so it's almost it's meant to be mysterious. Mm-hmm. How how inside a cocoon this this goop uh, mass of disintegrated cells suddenly 
has an appearance of imaginal cells that are going to become the butterfly. And how also this is so rich and deep and all the work we can do in transformation is that how also the the old cells actually attack the new cell, mm-hmm. even though, of course, the, the cocoon is, the caterpillar is designed by nature to become the butterfly, and yet there is an autoimmune attack from the old cells um, to the new but imaginal cells that are going to form the butterfly, uh, and if the and when and if and when the attack fails and there are enough of the you know the imaginal cells to have critical mass, that's when the butterfly is able to uh, form. Yes. And so so in transformation work or you know dropping your old stories, I like I like using a technique called writing away your old stories. So write it write it the way you would write it. Mm-hmm. Uh, stick to your you know your your version. But then give it away, perform it away, give it away in a short story, give it away to the world, put it in a book, and close the chapter on that. Um, and, and, and that's, I think, why art really works that way. It helps these goop cells to do their job and then, and then drop off, if we allow it to drop off. Mm-hmm. Um, and this autoimmune response is that resistance to change. Um, and so isn't it beautiful how nature designs transformation and yet also has accommodates for this uh, autoimmune attack and resistance to change and transformation, um, but then sets the butterfly free. Yes. Um, and also the word imaginal is just so rich, and, and I link it to imagination, and mm. it's, it's beautiful. I love that you, you enjoyed it and found a parable. And that's, uh, that's uh, turning that inside out uh, to the reality that we are as humans. It, it's clear that if we operate from our old story or we let our old cells dominate, then we're going to create dis-ease and so on. And I want to uh-huh. turn to uh, something else that was poignant for me when you distinguish the difference between love and fear. And let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so love and fear are the other uh, consistent, um, uh, you know, it's a consistent message throughout the book and throughout all the work I do. And... Um, uh, what I've com- I've distilled it down to understand that we create from one of those two places, mm-hmm. uh, love and fear. I mean, there's another fundamental emotion of, uh, uh, you know, grief that sits in between and joy. But, you know, I kind of uh, love and fear seem to rise to the top to be the two states from which we create. And so when we're when we're unconscious, which is where we're not the observer of ourselves. It's my definition of being unconscious, and, mm-hmm. and which is 99% of the people and all of us uh, often are not in observation of ourselves while we're also acting in the world, that simultaneous ability to observe. So the moment the observation, which is our own light falling onto our own darkness, is turned off, we're unconscious. And when we're unconscious, then we are typically acting from the old story, um, and the old story, mind you, is not just our story in this lifetime. It's the ancestral patterning as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. Um, if we've been part of a, a place that was ravaged with war or slavery or, you know, the female population with a lot of the um, uh, feminine oppression, we have that story, that mass story, the mass consciousness story playing. And then we, of course, have our amygdala, our, our lizard brain, our old reptilian brain at the base of our skulls uh, doing a lot of reactionary sort of so I call I put all that in our in fear-based creation and and the idea of fear-based creation is coming from a survivalistic stance Mm -hmm. so a survivalistic stance and I'm not talking about surviving uh, an extreme thing like an earthquake or you know a, a crisis I'm talking about Survive, a survivalist stance being the entire tone of one's life, which is this world is a difficult place. It's full of peril and obstacles, and I'm here to, to you know, every day get up and survive. So from this mindset, from this unconscious mindset, we're creating from fear because it's a fear, essentially a fear of death, mm-hmm. a fear of annihilation, a fear of being eaten by the tiger. Mm-hmm. Um, so everything ranging from our survival, you know, evolutionary, biological survivalistic stance to our story-related, story being both personal and mass consciousness, ancestral lineage, you know, all the stories that were handed down by our grandmothers about, you know, guess what, what our tribe had to do to be here, 
um, that gets added to our story, bag of stories, and we're acting from there, and we're acting from a preventative stance. So a preventative stance cannot be a creative stance. Mm-hmm. If I if I define creative as a new way of connecting the dots, a new way of looking at it, because we're we're just trying to prevent something, which is death. Mm-hmm. The creative stance, thriving, um, amazingly, is sort of orthogonal. It's not part of a spectrum where you know. Uh, surviving is on one end and creating is on the other end. I find that it's orthogonal. It's it's in in sort of like a cross. And I've been wondering if that uh, those the significance of the cross mm-hmm. um, and of being reborn or di- in a resurrection or dying on the cross. A lot of these uh, they're not just those symbols are not just unique to Christianity. A lot there's there are a lot of those kind of uh, axes like symbols in in many traditions. Yes. And religions, and I've been wondering if that that's representation of that orthogonal nature. So thriving is this understanding that death is happening all the time. The old story has to die for new power to unleash. The goop cells have to go away for the butterfly to be born, and the butterfly looks nothing like the caterpillar. And this is love because it is a kind of faith. It's a kind of unfettered. It's 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 an unfettered understanding of something much larger, and that's what I mean by love. I don't mean just the fleeting emotion of attachment to somebody, um, but but just the power that makes everything be. Mm-hmm. Um, and and from there, I am not afraid to drop the old story and drop all my identities uh, in every minute. Uh, and and that's when I'm creating. I'm not preventing anymore, and I'm I'm coming from a place of every moment I have faith in the new thing. Mm-hmm. Every moment I have faith that something greater is in concert with me and helping me create a new world. Yeah. Um, so. You 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 quote Marianne Williamson several times, an, an enlightened yes. spiritual writer who's currently running for Congress. I understand. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but amazing. In the law of divine, she says every loving thing that ever happened to you was real, and everything else was an illusion. Uh, mm-hmm. And and some of the illusions you talk about that draw us back into the abyss include money, uh, and and a belief in self righteous justice. Those are things that we struggle with all the time in this human life. I think. Uh, mm-hmm. But but uh, that admonition to hold an unerring faith and gratitude, leading life with assumption, the assumption that the world is a good place full of possibility, is so empowering. And I'm I'm wondering how you manage to maintain that given all the things that surround us. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you know, and not only surround us, but ha- you know, s- supposedly happened to us. And as mm-hmm. Marianne Williams said, everything that happened to you that caused pain is is an illusion. What, what that what that really is is understanding that um, it's not that it did not happen, mm-hmm. uh, but it happened in a way that you can only see with limited view. Um, so it's almost like what what I know what I do is that I um, when I'm well a lot of it has come from personally being in love, and when I say in love, I again I don't mean the the the, the smaller definition of it, which is a uh, feeling dominated only, mm-hmm. but but really opening your heart, um, and and you know how you when you open your heart you see the beauty, you see the beauty of a, the inner beauty of another when you connect to the soul of somebody, mm-hmm. um, and from that place it seems like um, I I'm just often. Uh, Able to well, let me give you an example here. I uh, I live in Seattle and I ha- I live in a little condo um, uh, in downtown uh, with uh, my back deck uh, looking at Mount Rainier. Mm-hmm. Except for those who know anything about Seattle, uh, it's cloudy often. That Mount Rainier is not uh, visible in the skyline. Um, and um, the the saying goes, "Is the mountain out today?" And it could be sunny. And bright, and still the the cloud cover can be adequate to to appear to make it appear like there just is no mountain. But of course, when the mountain appears in all its glory, it's such a tremendous, tremendous presence in the Seattle area that it just 
I've lived here 14 years, and every time I see it, I am in awestruck wonder. And everybody around here, as much as they tell the old story about rain and grayness, is like that. When the mountain is out, it's just like it just lights everybody up. And Mm -hmm. so uh, when my condo was priced and put on the market, the developers, whoever did it, a really quick job of it, the mountain wasn't out that day. So they listed the the condo as a no-view condo. (laughs) The, the day I came to look at it, it was also not out, but as I stood there meditating in a state of life that I was not, you know, supposedly not empowered to buy a place, I, I saw the cloud cover apart and a little thing poking out. Um, and I said to the, the woman showing me around the place, could that be the mountain? And she said, oh my God, yeah, and look at this, it's listed as a... Anyway, the, as the story goes, I often sit here and wonder on the days that the mountain is an out and there are clouds what is true is it true to say that there is no mountain Mm -hmm. Um, or is it once you know that there's a mountain behind the clouds it's like once you know there is love or divinity once you know there's something beyond what you're seeing in the moment which could be injustice which could be a, a terrible behavior on somebody's part once you know there is a power behind, what do you believe in? Mm-hmm. Do you do you do you bemoan the clouds and the grayness and and uh, or do you just know uh, the mountain exists behind? But because you know it, because it's going to uh, it's going to reveal itself every now and again. And so I and I've I've in the spirit of creating your own reality, I have noticed uh, using this metaphor of the mountain that when I trust in the mountain when I have faith in its showing and it's blessing me and gracing me with its presence, it shows up more often. <laughs> uh, and so that's how I do it. I, I focus constantly on what's behind, what's beyond, okay. what's beautiful, what's possible, what's constantly. Some of the practical things I do is, um, and I coach about it if people are willing, is I'm not into the news. I'm not into um the, the the thing that's happening the, the crisis in the world right now and mm-hmm. I'm I'm not really the important uh, information that will add to my ability to generate a better world comes to me naturally because mm-hmm. we're all you know as humans we're connected enough that it will come so um, or if there's a situation in my family that people are you know this happened the circumstantial stuff the storytelling I'm not into that I don't spend much time with it. So over time, that part of um, uh, things that accentuate our fear-based living atrophy, if you focus always on the mountain beho- behind, the mm-hmm. mountain beyond. Mm-hmm. You know, we're, we're down to our last minute, and that's unfortunate because we haven't begun to scratch the surface of how rich and useful this book is for anyone looking to be enlightened, looking for spirituality. And I, I even wanted to focus a little bit on your post face because after I'd read this book and was just in awe of the book, the post face on spirit uh, really struck me because, you know, you came from us. As I was reading, it, I said, well, she's probably Hindu. No, maybe she's Buddhist. No, she's exposed to New Thought Christianity. Oh, she's eclectic. But um, uh, yeah. your, your, your statement at the end about how you were raised in a highly secular and rather irreverent environment, um, and and yet somehow you came to these awarenesses that you've shared with us, and we haven't even touched on the importance of the yin and the yang and, and the importance of meditation before you begin to create and, and so on. Uh, there's so much in this book, and I en- encourage my readers to get a hold of it. You can get it on www.flyingchickadee.com, which is also a place where you can see more of Shahana's teachings. Uh, but as I say, it's available through Amazon. I know a friend who has it on Kindle as well. We've been talking with Shahana Dattagupta about you are Michelangelo and you are David, awakening the creative and creation within. I'm Dr. John Cook, your host this week. We want to thank our uh, underwriter, audiobooks.com, and encourage you, if you don't hear the program when it's aired four times this week, to also turn to our Facebook page, Good Books Radio, and you can pick up the program there. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. <laughs>